It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Pamela Ngambani. We're here in Jerusalem. And Pamela, you come from a very illustrious and very, very, very important and uh, very famous family. Your late father, Ben, was um, in the first cabinet of Nelson Mandela and uh, Thabo Mbeki, a premier of KwaZulu Natal, and an ambassador to Japan. So a very illustrious, a very important family, but we are so honored that you're here in Jerusalem. And thank you so much for spending the Shabbat with us. And we'd just love to hear your background and how you came to Israel and how you are so passionate about Israel, which we so appreciate. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Liz. So, yeah, um, my father, uh, made sure that my brothers and I had a very classical Western education. Um, so we went to King's School in Nottingham Road where we learned Greek and Roman mythology, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, I read the Odyssey like 20 times between primary school and high school um, and varsity and we did Shakespeare. So, you know, English, they taught us English, proper English, you know and history, ancient Greek, Roman history. So it was very well-rounded classical Western education. And then high school was a little bit different because it was much more mainstream, also very prestigious school, but the, the, the teaching was much more mainstream teaching. So it wasn't anything extraordinary, but it was very good quality of education, of course. And also, yeah, their history and English, I, I did very well and I enjoyed English and history. And eventually, when I went to university at UCT, I majored in, in history. Coming back, um, Pamela, you were born in, in KwaZulu-Natal. Mm, yeah. What year were you born? Oh, 1981. Um, and I was actually born in Mbangini Hospital, which then was a white-only hospital. But because my father was the, black, was the first black surgeon general of Mbangini Hospital, that's why I was born there. And he was very uh, good friends with Dr. Henderson from Mbangeni, very famous doctor who took my dad under his wing and, you know, we would visit their family and one of the few black families who actually interacted with white people on a friendly basis. So it was very interesting. Um, so I think something yeah. what you mentioned, the school that you went to in the Midlands. Yeah. It was very unusual because in those days you grew under apartheid mm -hmm. and black kids didn't really go to white private schools. Yeah, so uh, King's School was the first uh, private school. So government schools were segregated but private schools could choose. And it was the missionary schools that initially took black students. My father and his brothers and sisters all went to a missionary school in, in Marion Hill, Catholic missionary school. So they got a very good education. My father taught Latin at some point. So him and Mr. John Mitchell at King's actually used to speak Latin because Mitchell, John Mitchell, he spoke Latin, French, German, read uh, Greek myth, uh, ancient Greek. <laughs> so they used to talk and I think they formed a very strong bond because, you know, very unusual. Um, so um, he, he, sorry, what was the question? So you know, being in um, apartheid South Africa yes. at that time yeah, yeah. and going to a, yeah. a white school must have been, it had, it's, it was something very unusual. Yes, yeah, so King's was the first non-missionary white school to allow black students in South Africa. I think it was 1979 that they did that. And as a result, they lost all their government subsidies. And the government was on their case to the point where kids um, had to be smuggled into the school. There's a story of one boy who the, a priest put him in the boot of his car and drove him into the school because, you know, you weren't allowed to move from the township into white areas without the necessary documentation that gave you permission. And then even then, your stay was limited. So King's was a boarding school. So this boy, yeah, he had to be smuggled into the school. It was a very good education. Everyone who went there, you know, they, they can tell you it was a very good education. So... Can I just ask you, Pamela, um, did you ever experience apartheid, like anti-black feeling growing up? Did you, the segregation, not yeah, being able to he, go on, he, on buses, sitting on different 
Benches. So our parents took us to boarding school, I think specifically to protect us from having those experiences, you know. Um, so, but, and then when we were at home, we were moving between our home and our, our family, our relations. So we never really, but we did have those few glimpses into apartheid. Our parents sheltered us a lot, so we didn't really experience it, but it was there, you know. Like, for example, one night we had the police in the brown uniform come into our house while we were all sleeping to look for like documents and stuff and I remember my younger brother Alfred he was so traumatized by that because he was still asleep and then I think he was woken up by the police and he sees these police and for years after that whenever he'd see a policeman he would totally freak out you know so that was hectic and then just a few moments here and there where you'd be walking in the shopping mall um, and this was after Nelson Mandela was released from prison and there was a lot of just negativity from white people. You know, I remember one time some white boy spat at my brother. You then, saw it? Yeah, I was with my mom and my brother and then my older brother. And then um, my brother got really upset, obviously. And then my mother confronted the guy and he just like totally dismissed her. You're not Nelson Mandela. Get out of here, you know. So there were those things, you know, where you would. And then I think in high school a lot of the girls so kings had a lot of black kids so what happened is when the black kids started coming into kings a lot of the white parents took their kids out so by the time i got there it was predominantly black which is very interesting a whole bunch of black kids learning shakespeare from an english family you know <laughs> um but in my high school it was mostly white and so while i think a lot of people had been taught at home that you know racism is wrong you still got those feelings and those and then people saying ov overtly racist things you know with just as if it was normal you know so you can see like in in some people's homes there was racism was rife but they tried to tone it down and can i was coming home there at school you spoke english mm -hmm. you speak english beautifully <laughs> but coming home your mother tongue was zulu yeah and your friends that you had yeah so yeah, it was, I mean, and this kind of became a theme in my life, which is a little bit sad, but um, I got home first after, after the first term of school, and I went out to look for my friends. I'm like six years old, you know, got to look for my friends, and they told me like, no, we can't, we can't hang out with you. Our parents say you go to a white school, you're with white people, you speak English, you're pretty much white now or something, you want to be white, so we can't, we can't hang out with you, and that was... That was pretty shocking, you know. Cause it must have been very traumatic being a, yeah. a six-year-old. Yeah, it was traumatic because you just, I didn't understand, like, what on earth this has to do with us, you know. But the parents of the kids had told them this, you know. And like I said, it kind of became a theme in my life, you know, constantly being ostracized because I'm going to the school. And then it became about my dad. My dad is this big wig. And I'm supposed to have a particular sort of, like, personality because of that you know and I, I just I, I was always being held to like a different standard to most people because of my dad and I just wanted to be a normal person like I just didn't see what it's not, it's not like I was the minister of arts culture science and technology or the premier or the ambassador I was just his daughter like can I just be a normal person anyway so but that was just the story of my life it was very very strange that people judge you based on who your family is I mean I guess people would you know but it's just uh, i don't know it was just i found it very oppressive and so i tried as much as i could to try and create my own identity um but it's not like i had a bad relationship with my parents or anything you know they raised us well and everything and i was very close to my dad and we would discuss politics and history and you know um so i went through this being an outsider trying to fit in unsuccessful because it just wasn't my personality to do the things that everyone was doing I've, I've always been looking for the truth so eventually um and one of the problems i had growing up was we grew up roman catholic and one of the problems i had is that we were never given the opportunity to really explore the bible and this is one of the amazing things that i've seen in jewish culture is that the torah the tanakh it's really like it's it's explored it's discussed each character is magnified to explain its meaning we didn't have that in the roman catholic church it was the priest there he would tell us what we needed to know and then we all went home and then we repeated every sunday 
But during the week, people just lived as pagan as the next person. You know, maybe a little bit more self-righteous. I don't know. Or maybe it's just my lens that I was looking through. I'm sure there's some very proper Christian disciple-making Catholics out there, no doubt. You know, I mean, the missionaries who educated my parents were very good people. So I can't say all Catholics, mm -hmm. but there was just, in my experience, an overriding sense of this religion is being done as a social symbol, like a social status. Because it's a quite a high status thing to be a, a, a Christian, you know. It comes with a lot of respectability. And especially if you're middle class, you know, it, it has that thing. But Jesus wasn't about us being social status people. It was about go make disciples. And if you read about his life and what he said, it's not about being popular and chic, <laughs> you know, it's about being real. And I, I, I was looking for that realness. So, I mean, I, I I really got into the Greek mythology because then I also thought maybe these gods are the ones who make sense. They seem to be more human and more relatable. And I was really drawn to Athena, the goddess of war and strategy and wisdom. And those are things that I like. I like strategy. I like people who think strategically. Um, I, I very much admire people in the military. You know, I think the IDF is amazing, you know. I mean, the fact that it's called the IDF, you know, it's a defense force by choice. You know, they chose to be a defense force. Other armies are like aggressive forces. They go out to, to pursue national interests, you know, whereas Israel has chosen to use this army to defend itself against enemies to the point where like the Iron Dome was created so they wouldn't have to, have to actually even attack anyone. That's how much defense is, is the motivating factor, you know, so very interested in the military, edu uh, learning, I love knowledge, I love learning. Um, so I did history at university and that was great, I really enjoyed that. Um, my final paper was on the academic history of my aunt Harriet Ngubane. She, she was my father's older sister. She also uh, went to Marion Hill Missionary School and she actually got my father and her younger siblings in. So, but how they got in initially was my uncle studied at the seminary. He went to the school and decided at the seminary, he became a priest. He was a Catholic priest for decades. Very good man, very, very sweet. And then my aunt Harriet studied at, at Marion Hill and she became a teacher. And then she also got my father and my aunt and uncle in there. And my, she always used to say my father was her favorite brother and they were very close. And she also got into politics. Um, but she had such an interesting story. She was a teacher at Marion Hill, and I don't know how, but someone told her, like, you know, you should really go to university and study, because she's a very, very brilliant woman. I mean, she was teaching while raising a family, and then she started studying as well. So eventually she got a BA in anthropology, and then she wanted to do her master's, a BA in honors in anthropology, and she wanted to do her master's, but because she was a black woman, she couldn't do it in South Africa. So she got a scholarship to go to Cambridge University. Yeah, so she went to Cambridge, did her master's and her PhD. And she did her, and she published a book called Body and Mind in Zulu Medicine. So it's talking about how um, the work of a Zulu medicine man incorporates the body and the mind of the person in the healing process. So this book actually was so groundbreaking because there was a whole bunch of like academic dons in Cambridge in the anthropology department who thought they knew what Zulu anthropology was and she completely shattered all their perceptions like she broke down all the theories that they had developed you know because I mean she was a Zulu woman she knew, she knew how to talk to the people so the problem is that a lot of the times these English people would come even if they had translators they wouldn't be given the proper information or they wouldn't be able to understand the information from a cultural perspective and so their interpretation was not accurate, you know. And so she came and she just totally blew them away. Um, and then, if I'm not mistaken, she was actually the first woman PhD in South Africa from Cambridge or, or something. But she's very much like a pioneer. And she came back and she taught, um, I think she taught at UCT for a bit. And then she got into politics as well. You know, but she always stayed in academic and she wrote more books. Um, she passed away, it was 2008, 2007, and, while she, and, and at that time she was still working on a book. She, 
was working on a book on African cosmology. Um, it's a very complicated, long story, but it was great. It was great, and she she really inspired me, you know. So, um, how I ended up in Israel? Okay, Actually, can I just ask what yeah. in politics? What was her position? Oh, okay. So she was an MP, and she was dealing with water issues and women's issues. Yeah. And she was the MP for the Encarta Freedom. Was she in Qatar? I think she was IFP, yeah. She was never really like into party politics mm -hmm. as much as my father. My father was like very strong in the IFP. She was very much an academic. I think she went into politics because she really wanted to help people um, okay. as opposed to actual in, in being involved in statecraft, you know, whereas yeah. my father was much more into statecraft. So if I can ask, Pamela, because it is intriguing, your father was involved in medicine. Where did he, where did he study medicine? Oh yeah, yeah. So he because that also for a black to study medicine in South Africa was extremely difficult. Yeah, yeah. It was restricted. Way. There were yeah. very few. that were, were allowed the privilege to study medicine in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so he started off at Natal University, and then he went to Wits, and then he went back to Natal to specialize in tropical medicine. Yeah. So he got his degree at Wits. Vitz and Natal. I'm just not sure exactly how it worked because there was so much stuff to always talk about with my dad that I never got the details about how he actually, what stage of his studies he did where. Um, but I know it was Howard University and Natal University that he did uh, medicine. Um, and that's where he also met Steve Biko. There's actually a picture wow. of them. They, yeah. they were in the SRC together. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then Steve got too much into politics and then he dropped out and whatever. And my dad carried on, he got his degree. Because um, Steve so, also studied medicine. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did study medicine. So, I mean, you know, it's just interesting that I'm in Israel right now and I'm talking to you about this and about apartheid because, I mean, I haven't been in a hospital in Israel, but from what I understand, you have Arab and Israeli doctors, Arab and Jewish doctors, Christian doctors, all working together. Patients together. Patients from everywhere. I mean, I heard about kids from Gaza coming here to get surgery, Palestinian jihadis. Who get shot by Israelis in self-defense get treated in Israeli hospitals. That wasn't going to happen in in South Africa during apartheid. Like you, if you if you attacked an apartheid policeman and he beat you to a pulp, he would leave you on the street to die. There were separate, or, there were separate they, ambulances. They, yeah, or they'd arrest you and put you in jail to die. <laughs> Not only that, there were separate, and there were separate, separate hospitals, separate yeah. ambulances. Like I said, I was born in a white-only hospital because my dad happened to be the Surgeon General of the district and he got, he was nurtured by this white man who saw the brilliance in him, you know, so there wasn't normal. And how did your happen. father get involved in, in the IFP, the Encounter Freedom Party, and then becoming a cabinet minister in Nelson Mandela's first cabinet? Yeah, yeah, so he was a doctor and he worked with the Red Cross, so he was telling us like he had this jeep, you know, like a jeep so he could go through like the countryside terrain and you know it was obviously another thing you know it wasn't normal for a black person to let alone have a car and then this jeep you know so he was working with the red cross and then through that because he's very he was very smart very articulate man um he got into politics because he knew how to communicate with people as their doctor and also he he knew how to understand the imperatives of transforming a society, you know, from degradation into some sort of progress and development. Um, yeah, and I mean, he was an SCR, SRC and he, um, so the SRC obviously is also political and he was surrounded by political activists. So I think it just, it was just a natural thing for him to do. And I think he would have also been encouraged by a lot of people to do so because he was so articulate and intelligent and connected to the people, you know, as a doctor with the Red Cross. So in 1922, he became Minister of Finance for the, of, for the province of KwaZulu-Natal. So he was, he was good, like he ran his, he had a surgery in, in Nguelezane where we lived and, you know, he ran it as a business and he, uh, later on, uh, he studied an, a master's in economics from London University correspondence mm -hmm. while he was and this is after 94 so that was pretty amazing so his work ethic was like second to none like I don't know how he did it but he had time to like be a doctor read encyclopedias 
because that's how that's how I got into education as well. He bought us like kiddies encyclopedias, yeah. and then he bought them. So he bought us kiddies encyclopedias, and we kind of were like, yeah, all right, whatever. You know, TV is much more interesting. And then he bought himself a set of Britannica encyclopedias, so he would constantly take one off the shelf and just wow. read it. And so then I got into the habit of taking one of the kids' ones and reading. So he led by example. You know, he was like a leader in all spheres, I guess, of his life. And yeah, he just he was in the SRC, and then you know his interaction with people, and then he he joined the IFP as well. So when so he joined the IFP. It's the Nkata Freedom Party. Nkata Freedom Party. And the Mangosuthu Butelezi. Prince Mangosuthu Butelezi, yes. Did your father have a personal connection with Butelezi? Yes, yes. No, he did. He did. He. I think he was. Um, he was always such a nice person as well. Like everyone really liked him because he's always smiling and laughing, telling jokes, but also very, very serious. You know, like serious about things, and taking things seriously. Like, um, in terms of like, if, if if you ever asked him to advise you, it was always very strategic. You know, it wasn't just vague. He was always very specific about being strategic. So I think that's why he also was admired in the party that this is someone who can actually lead as as a statesman not just a talking head you know so he, he was able to combine his scholarly knowledge with practical application <coughs> yeah so 90 <coughs> so he was with the IFP 94 he didn't also involve us in politics or anything he like he always kept us very separate from his work very very separate to the point where I'm actually able to like fly under the radar it's only when I tell people who he is that they actually know I'm not like other, there's other politicians, people, they know their kids, you know, because their kids are like in the forefront, but my father always kept us away from politics. And are you happy that he did? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, at some point I was like, oh, I want to get a job in government. He was like, no. He didn't even like want me to use my own merits to get in there. He was just, just go study and do something else. You don't want to be in this politics. It's, it's, it's crazy, you know. And he was always able to hold his own, but I think having experienced that pressure he didn't want us to find ourselves you know in that pressurized environment um yeah so i just yeah i studied and his first position in government mm. as a cabinet minister so yeah he so prince butelezi was minister of home affairs no 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 he was the second deputy president mm, that's right. along with the clerk yes so he was the second deputy president, and then my father was minister of arts, culture, science, and technology. Um, and then he had a short stint after Dr. Frank Mdlalosa passed away as the premier of KZN. It's KwaZulu Natal. KwaZulu Natal, yeah. I was in high school then. Um, and there was a point where my dad spoke at my school, at my brother's school, and at the boys' school, like in the town, <laughs> at, the, at their at their speech day, you know, so it's one of those things you grow up with, your dad is like, oh, your dad is the premier, and okay, whatever, cool, you know, it was great, but well, like I say, I'm just, I'm not someone who likes to, I don't see how that has anything to, how that gives me any merit, like, I don't, I don't get merit from my father's achievements, they're great, but they don't mean I am meritous as a person you know when, when he was cabinet minister you did you move to Pretoria today it's called Swanee yeah so we were still in boarding school but on holidays we would go to the house in Pretoria and the house in Cape Town yeah so very and beautiful property in, in did Pretoria you, did you personally ever meet with Nelson Mandela yes I met Nelson Mandela I can't remember now when but my father was minister of arts and culture and there was that four, uh, six, 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 four concert. Um, so what happened is I was with my dad and we met Nelson Mandela, I think on Robben Island. Yeah, and we spoke to him before he came to, to meet all the dignitaries. And Ahmed Katrada was also there. And um, I can't remember the other. Ahmed Katrada and, and him, they were the two last surviving uh, Ravonia trialists mm -hmm. after Mandela passed away. I can't remember the other one's name. But anyway, they also were the custodians of the Robin Island Museum. So we went to Robin Island Museum and yeah, I spoke to Nelson Mandela. I, th I, I remember asking him some cliched words of wisdom question, you know, because I don't know, I mean, this is Nelson Mandela. But what was interesting was that he was so like ordinary as a person, like he didn't have any sort of like vibe of being the greatest statesman of the 21st century, mm -hmm. you know. 
Very modest, extremely modest. Yeah, I mean, of the 20th century. Yeah, he was very, yeah, very modest, just matter of fact. And the, even the advice he gave me, it was, it wasn't like some, like, vene, vedi, vici type thing, you know? <laughs> it was very, like, yeah, just work hard and be honest and you'll, you'll succeed. And I, was I like, think the most amazing okay. thing is that he averted a civil war in the country. Yeah. And he included the National Party and the... IFP, the Carter Freedom Party, into his government, yeah. which was unbelievable what mm, he did. Mm, it was mm. very, very special. And yeah, he, was he, unified, he unified the nation. He yeah. actually unified into a rainbow nation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he built bridges, eh? He built bridges and he... I think, I mean, you know, and it's just, it's sad that people are always like, oh, Nelson Mandela, he didn't uh, do... It's almost like people expected him to do everything. You know, he was supposed to stop the civil war, create an inclusive government, govern as president, stop being president for the sake of democracy, because he set an example to say, once a leader's term is finished, he should step out of power graciously. And if I could just mention, nobody really wanted him to leave. No. He was so popular him, yeah. that when he said, I've had my, my term, and now new blood should come in, mm, and exactly. he appointed uh, Mbeki, yeah. Tabo Mbeki. People mm. didn't want him to leave, so yeah. he is very unique in that regard. Mm, mm, mm. Worldwide, yeah. there are many world leaders, many not world only in Africa, worldwide. That yeah, I mean, Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher couldn't handle it when she was told to mm. vacate Downing Street. I mean, for years afterwards, she was just, she couldn't, you know. And yeah, and he transitioned so well from being the president of the country to being like an elder statesman who traveled around, had his foundation, you know, and I think he lacked a lot of support because people unfortunately didn't share his ethos of selfless leadership, you know, and statesmanship. There's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of like, I think he had a very long-term goal, a long-term vision for South Africa, you know, like him, him ending his, him not running for a second term was him saying to South African people, to African people, world people, saying, your job is to serve your people to the best of your ability. And sometimes the best of your ability doesn't involve you being at the helm. Yeah. Sometimes you need to be behind the scenes serving people, you know, whereas a lot of people think being a leader means being at the helm, you know. And I mean, what's ironic is that you'll get a lot of people who want to be at the helm, but then they want to stay in the back of the, of the fighting force. You know, Century. if you want to be in the helm, be like Julius Caesar. Be in the in the in the front front lines. You know, be in the war zone. Then you can be at the helm. But don't be at the helm and then you want to be in your office while people are dying out there in the trenches. You know, figuratively speaking. So, I mean, Mandela sacrificed himself. You know, we know 27 years in prison. He couldn't bury his son. You know, he, he couldn't raise his children. You know, he suffered. He was he was in the trenches. You know, he was at the coal face. And then, you know, when he when he stepped down, I think. I think we missed an opportunity to learn. But unfortunately, also like, I don't think education. He always supported education, but I don't think education was given the prominence that it ought to have been given by our government after ninety four, um, because you know one thing I know about Israel education is so important and, and in the Jewish culture education is so important because it's understood that even the poorest person if they have an education they have dignity you know because they're able to provide for themselves they can have a trade you know um, and also just knowing to learn knowing how to read the Torah you know it's important to be able to, to think critically you know because a critical mind is also able to acquire knowledge without having to be taught you know you can you can self teach and you can be a lifetime learner and knowledge knowledge really is key and i think unfortunately one of the things that's happened in south africa is you know this motto goes around it's not about what you know it's about who you know it's so tragic it is so tragic that means a person can't actually be self sufficient and self reliant a person is always reliant on everyone and i mean maybe you could say oh no well ubuntu says a person is a person through other people umundu, 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 umundu. but that's not what, what that means you know you don't need other people to survive you need other people because that's just life that's creation we live together but more than that ubuntu is actually about your actions impact other people so you should be a self-contained 
person who's able to lead their own lives and who's able to be self self-sufficient you know and self-reliant because the more self-sufficient and self-reliant you are the more able you can impact people's lives positively imagine if someone needed my help and before i could help them i had to phone someone else that i knew that's not that's not being efficient you know so i just think it's very sad you know and that's 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 what's happened you know it's not and then also you have a situation where there's a lot of unemployed graduates in south africa and so it just seems to prove that very erroneous maxim it's not about what you know it's about who you know you know and then that becomes a patronage thing you know who can ha who can hand out the most favors can get the most votes and the most likes and the most whatever you know so i just i think it's a very destructive mentality it's a perversion of ubuntu and i just it's one of the things which i hope i hope will change so um so Pema, i just want to mention because what you're saying is so relevant your father became an ambassador to Japan, mm -hmm. and you, as the daughter of the ambassador, I mean, you could have, you could have had a free ride on just having that my father was the South African ambassador to Japan. Yeah. But you chose not to. Well, he also didn't want us to use his name for anything. Like, even when people came and asked us for favors, or to ask us to talk to him to do, he'd be like, no, mm-mm. He just made it clear, like, my work is my work. It has, it's, yes, it enables me to give you guys a good education and you can travel all over the world, whatever, whatever, fine, cool. But he never wanted us to be involved and to use his name to advance ourselves. Like, he never did. He would, he would help us to do research, you know. For example, he, he helped me get in touch with the Jewish Board of Deputies when I decided I wanted to do my master's on the historical processes that allow, that caused the ANC to adopt the 2017 resolution to downgrade the embassy in Israel um, to a liaison office. So he, he gave me contacts that got me in touch with the Jewish Board of Deputies, you know. So that's the kind of thing he would have done. But in terms of like give, uh, helping us get jobs in government or with his friends, or, he never did any of that. It was like, just, just go study and work you know and just make something of yourself you know which is good which is good you know um so i just want to ask you you mentioned uh, earlier today that when you were in japan you accompanied your father to the emperor and his wife yeah yeah there must have been a very very special moment special yeah memory yeah yeah no it was very surreal because i was like I, I was thinking to myself afterwards like there's probably majority of Japanese people have never met the emperor, naturally, right? They've probably seen him, probably seen him on TV, most of them, you know. But I met him, you know, in person. So he was delivering his credentials as the new ambassador. And so we had a carriage ride from the train station to the palace in Tokyo. And, you know, we came inside and we were led. I mean, the Japanese do protocol like no one else. They're like so proper and cultured and graceful. It's incredible. So we went in and, you know, we bowed to the emperor and empress. Uh, I think they were at the top of the stairs. I can't remember the whole thing because it was so surreal. And like, I, like I thought I was dreaming most of the time. Um, so we bowed and we were with like other ambassadors and their wives. I was with my dad because my mom couldn't come. She was, she had business in South Africa, so she couldn't leave it to come to Japan at that point. Um, so then we went and we had an audience. Each person got five minutes with the with the emperor and the empress each. I can't remember what I spoke to the emperor about because I was just so starstruck. I, I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. This is incredible. Oh my gosh. So by the time the five minutes was over, I probably said one or two things to him. And I was just like, uh, you know. But with his wife, what happened with the empress is I told her that we had gone to this place called Gifu. So Gifu is an imperial town, um, I think that's correct, and they have a very interesting cultural uh, industry called cormorant fishing. So a cormorant is a seabird, it eats fish. So what they do is they take herds of cormorant, like six, and they fish with them. So the cormorant sells the fish, and then they take the fish out of the cormorant's throats, and then they harvest, that's how they fish, and they do it at night with a fire at the prow of the boats so 
the, the light from the fire reflects on the scales of the fish and the cormorant. The cormorant are on leashes. They dive down, swallow the fish, and then they make it regurgitate and they put it in the basket. <laughs> so far out. And then they send them to the imperial palace, those fish. Wow. Yeah. So we went there and I told her about that and she was like, oh, and then she started describing the scenery and she's like, you know, one time I was there and I was, I don't know if she was looking at a bridge or on a bridge and she was watching the sunset. I don't know why that stuck with me, but I just always think about that when I think of the, that visit because I just thought, here's this amazing, and she was so soft-spoken and gentle. She said this is very gentle energy and so soft-spoken. <clears throat> but also you can see like so deeply cultured and deeply educated and just incredible like I was like okay this is this is what it means for someone to be an empress to be a royal you know you need to be cultured and educated and and humble and humane and appreciate beauty you know because there's something important about being able to appreciate God's beauty it really is something important it it, it shows that you know your place you know, because the Bible says the Lord establishes kings and he put, takes down kings, you know, like, don't be Nebuchadnezzar, you know, be like the Empress of Japan, <laughs> you know, you know, like be humble and appreciate the beauty and, and just, she, I mean, she spoke to me like I was her friend, like, you know, she, like, I thought, I thought it was, that was quite an, a personal reflection for her to, to and give And how old were you, you at know? this time? I think I was like, it was 2004, so I would have been 23, yeah. Yeah, just out of varsity, didn't know what to do with myself. So my father was like, just, why don't you come to Japan? Maybe you'll figure something out. Okay, why not? I don't mind going to Japan, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, but it was a very interesting experience. Not exactly what I expected, because the cultures are so different from where I was coming from. Um, so I, I, and also I just, yeah, it was like a little bit of a identity crisis, you know. Um, situation because I didn't expect the culture to be what what it, what it was and the language barrier was very strong I didn't expect that either I think that was probably one of the things that put me in a little bit of a I don't know how to say but out of sorts you know because <clears throat> no, one, no one really speaks English and at the shops also it's very difficult to find someone who speaks English and most of the signs are in Japanese you know and also I'm, I'm a single woman and that that, that that culture is not very friendly to single foreign women. Um, <clears throat> you should be with other women. <clears throat> and I'm a bit of a loner, I'm like a very solitary person. So I'm just the kind of person who goes off on their own thing and that's not the cultural norm. So I, 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 I sort of stuck out in a very bad way. So it was a bit uncomfortable, it was a bit of an uncomfortable experience. But my brothers had a great time. Because, you know, for men, a single man, I mean, they, they, it's, I guess you could say it's a patriarchal society. It's not like they oppress women or anything, but it's just, it's a very male-oriented society. Like, culturally, um, when a couple gets married, the man will work and the woman will stay at home with the kids and raise a family. That's the cultural norm, which I think is fine, you know. But also for women, have are, you're not expected to be all, all over the place by yourself, which is how I am. So, but my brothers had a great time. And my, my younger brother learned Japanese. He's very fluent in Japanese. Awesome. Yeah. So I just want to ask, after coming back from Japan, um, your father, when he finished being uh, the ambassador and when he finished politics, did he ever discuss with you his disappointment, how he saw how the um, state was captured and the corruption? Did that upset your father a lot? Yeah, I mean, I think he, my father was a realist, you know, um, he never, he never had any illusions about things are going to be perfect, you know, he was a very realistic person, um, but I think what disappointed him more than anything else was the lack of education for the people, lack, lack of proper education for the people, because he knew that obviously, you know, there's going to be, I mean, we're in Africa, corruption is kind of like a norm, you know. So I think he knew, <clears throat> and there's multinational corporations that want to extract minerals from the ground. So I think he knew all that type of stuff was going to happen. I think his hope was if the society could just be educated enough to be self-sufficient, mm -hmm. then they could be insulated from corruption and then also themselves hold politicians to account. 
you know so and I, I agree you know a popula- an, an educated population is the best safeguard of democracy it's the best it's the only real safeguard in the long term so I think that was his major issue um, and then yeah in terms of the politicians I think he, he was a realist he knew there's nothing and he understands even why why patronage is such a thing because he knows power broking it's all about making friends and relationships unfortunately patronage takes it to a negative place Relationship building and politics, you need it, but it should be for the advancement of the people, not for personal gratification. You know? And Pamela, when your father passed away, mm-hmm. um, at, the, at the funeral and afterwards, did a lot of traditional leaders and a lot of members of parliament and cabinet ministers, did they come and visit the family to show respects? So my father actually passed away literally on the morning of those insanely terrible riots in KZN. It was on that morning, and it was at the height of COVID, and he, he passed away from COVID pneumonia. So it was just, and, and so people couldn't come, but a lot of people did phone in. And so he passed away when the riot started? That morning. Which was, it was a very dark moment was, in South horrific. African history. It was, it was a horrific time. Yeah. We actually were all saying like, you know, in a way, it's as You didn't get to see it. Yeah. We, we were like, it's almost like, well, not almost like, but we just, my mom and I and my aunts, we all actually, we were interested in the fact that all three of us expressed that we thought of King Josiah when that happened. You know, that it was only after he died that things just started getting really bad in That's Israel. Because, yeah. On I mean, the same day? Same, yeah, that morning when it just kicked off and became insane. That's, you know, and I mean, it had been festering, you know, you could see that, but the morning that, you know, it, was that chaotic takeover of the warehouses and all that? That's the morning. So we were all just like, and and it was interesting also that later on that day, they were interviewing Prince Butelezi, and he said, you know, I wish I could rather have been in my grave than to see this. Wow. And we just thought, you know, that's our father was spared because it would have broken his heart. I mean, he worked hard for the people of KwaZulu Natal, and he really believed in education. There's a lot of people who will tell you that, you know. He really believed in education. He himself was a result of education. You know, his mother had just made it a point that her kids are getting educated. So, and he just, he would have just said, like, this this is what happens when you don't educate your population and you don't make them self-sufficient. Amazing. Yeah. Now, Pamela, I want to ask you, what made you decide to do your 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 studies on the downgrading of the embassy? What, what, mm. what, what prompted you to to choose that subject because it's a very interesting but a very unusual subject to do further studies on mm-hmm. but to do advance yeah. your, your your education on so um i became a born again christian so there's a rabbi we were talking to so i i'm, I'm in israel because of bridges for peace uh, i came to their israel their institute for israel studies so we've had rabbis come and talk to us you know and one rabbi said um, that it's very funny to him when Christians say they're born again <laughs> because it's like, okay, whatever. But um, he says when you convert to Judaism, you, you become adopted into the family of the Jewish family. And it's a rebirth? Yeah, so it's a kind of a rebirth, but he says born again, whatever. Anyway, so he's always found it funny. So anyway, I was born again in 2019, December 2019. Incidentally, on my birthday, 20, 29th of December, 2019. And two days before that, I had been doing a Bible study. And I suddenly hit me that, oh my gosh, I can actually have a personal relationship, you know, with the God of the universe. What? Mind-blowing. Because as a Catholic, you always go through your priest. You confess to your priest. You go to your priest. You, you know, there's all these layers between you and God. Whereas now, I was being told that with this book in your hand, you can talk to God. With the Bible. With the Bible, yeah. So so I started reading the Bible for the first time. And I realized, I thought I knew the Bible. I just, I realized I didn't. So I started reading the Bible. And then I was amazed at the Old Testament. That it's actually Jewish. <laughs> you never knew. I never knew. I honestly never knew. I just, I mean, I mean, I, I had heard of Israel, Babylon, you know. But it just, it didn't resonate in my head I guess so I started reading the Bible and I'm like these are all Jewish people King David Esther 
hi guy amos what and then i got really interested in like end days prophecies you know and then obviously i read the the new testament and then i also was like he was teaching in a synagogue jesus was teaching in a synagogue he was a jewish rabbi this is insane and you never knew i never that. knew he was a jewish rabbi i thought he was a christian you never <laughs> like, knew he was born to a jewish mother or no nothing i didn't know anything about his jewish background i just and because the old testament was in greek in my mind i just thought he was maybe greek i don't know what i thought jesus who where he was from honestly i just so it hits me that jesus was a jew and i was just like he was a jew so this is actually a jewish religion essentially right it's got a hebraic background it's actually completely a hebrew religion because everyone was jewish who brought us the scripture everyone paul peter james who i was actually told was actually uh jacob apparently king james wanted his name in the bible so he renamed jacob james i don't know that's a lot anyway so uh yeah all of them they were all jews shocking honestly I, peter the name peter does not say jewish to me it says greek or something you know so yeah so i just so then i i think his hebrew name was Saul. oh really look at that you see i mean there's so much to learn that's that's one thing i definitely know this trip with bridges for pieces to show me it's so much to learn so had you ever met a a, a jew before no when you were at I've uct or UG. growing up in the midlands or yeah you know the the oh actually i had met a jew before now i remember there was a boy i went to school with elan kirkle he was a jew that was the only jew i ever met him and his older brother um but it wasn't like it was just something that we heard in passing oh he was a jew and we had learned a little bit about the holocaust but i think it was just we were so far removed from it and I think because of the Bible being removed from its Jewish ancestry, I think we saw that growing up, I think my understanding of the Jews was like they are people who adopted Judaism, but they're not the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It wasn't that connection. It was and you studied history at UCT, modern history as well, mm -hmm. and you studied about the World War Two. Yeah. And your studies about the Holocaust, did that have... Uh, any profound impact on you or yes well i mean i i just saw this crazy story of hitler and his desire to exterminate the jewish people from the world you know and it was just but i think it was also taught very much from a white supremacy perspective so it didn't connect once again to the jewish identity which was what he actually had an, a problem with he actually a problem with the jewish identity it wasn't just a white supremacy thing and then there was a lot of emphasis put on, oh, there were also black people who were killed by Hitler. There were gays, there were disabled people. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of downplaying of the Jewish narrative, the Jewish story. But it was against the Jews. It was anti-Jewish, you know. Everyone else kind of like incidentally was just added in because, oh, actually, while we're at it, let's just get rid of those people too, you know. Um, so, and I, did a, I actually did a course also in history called The Making of the Modern Middle East. Israel was hardly spoken about hardly it was just a case of like oh in 1948 these white people came to this land and decided to take it over and they had the support of the white United Nations and the support of America and Britain and so well obviously anyway the Jews control the world so who's surprised about that you know like that kind of vibe you know and then, and then, so, I mean, this was UCT, and I was just like, oh, well, you know, it was just always like, who knows, whatever, you know. And in Cape Town, you didn't interact with any Jewish students or no. go to the Jewish Museum? No, is... nothing. And, then, and, and there was a very negative perception of the Jews. In South Africa, the, the perception of, the, of Israel and the Jews is negative. Just, it's pretty much... It's in the media. 99% negative. So even at varsity, even if I had, it was always like Israel's an apartheid state. Well, it, by then it hadn't started, but I know the Durban conference happened, but I, we didn't, I didn't know about the Durban conference. I mean, I learned about it later between nine, 2019 and now with my research. I started to find out about these things, but there was always just an overall assumption that obviously Israel is an apartheid state. Obviously the Jews control the world. Obviously the protocols of Zion 
is true yeah the protocols of zion that was like a thing that people actually treated as reality as truth it's actually some people think it's it's an actual primary source yeah it was a russian forgery yeah which was used to justify the pogroms in the holocaust it's horrific i mean i read it and i was like so reading it obviously i was like oh well these jews anyway you know israel so I, I also was in that mind state israel's an apartheid state these are not real jews they're askenazi khazars blah 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 you know so anyway i started reading the bible and i started reading the ancient history of egypt i mean of israel how they came out of egypt moses and it all just became alive you know i think when you start having faith in god the bible starts coming to life you know you start reading it as an actual thing that ha- like an actual history um then i started from a historical perspective reading about israel and the founding of israel and you know I, and it wasn't like the pastor who was teaching me was pro israel or anything there wasn't any of that but it was just starting to do my own independent reading because everything i was getting was either from the media or from someone else so it was always like secondary so now I'm starting to do my own independent research and I was just so shocked to see like the struggle that the Jewish people had to get a state even after the Holocaust and then there's people who actually say like it's insane they'll say oh the Jews manufactured the Holocaust so that they could get the state of Israel I'm like if they went through all that trouble shouldn't they have gotten the entire British mandate <laughs> but like most of it went to Jordan and now this tiny piece that's left over, which they should be having all to themselves, they're being told they need to share it with the Palestinians who want to kill them. Not all the Palestinians, but you know, the jihad is real. I'm like, this is, so yeah, like, so studying that history, the struggles, the, the miraculous survival after 48 and 67, you know, I just, I started to see that, okay, there's something going on here, which for some reason, some people out there don't want me and other people to know about this they just want us to assume that the jews are evil they control the world they don't deserve to have a state of their own they're doing it as some sort of a colonial project it's the last vestiges of european colonialism which is what you hear academics actually say academics who should know better we should do independent research but they don't they just go with the flow and you know so i'm reading all this stuff and i'm like but it doesn't add up you know the words of the Declaration of Independence, they took what Arthur Balfour said in the Balfour Declaration and put it in there. We will take care of everyone who lives in this country, Jew or not. And that's that's what's happening. So I'm just, I don't understand. I'm still trying to wrap my head around how it's possible for something to be so distorted. I mean, I'm in Israel. I haven't seen any apartheid. I've seen Jewish kids in a school with Arab kids, with Ethiopian Jews, I've met Jews from India who've made Aliyah, you know, the the sons of Manasseh. Who knew, right? And they left with the Babylonian exile. That's that. So they don't know about Hanukkah because it was after their time. But now they're in Israel now, oh, there's actually a Hanukkah. And then now they're learning their history. Jews from Ethiopia, you know, Jews from Cuba. South America who were thrown out with the Reconquista of 1492. I didn't even know that the Reconquista involved throwing Jews out. I thought it was just about blacks and Moors and Arabs. Inquisition? You never heard? Inquisition was all about Christian persecution of, I mean Catholic persecution of Catholics and Muslims, but nothing about the Jews. So the Jews have just been like taken out of history. It's, it's, it's incredible because it's like, it's almost like someone sits with a toothpick and just takes out the Jews from history takes out the Jewish identity, takes out the Jewish identity of Jesus to the point where today there are people telling us that Jesus was a Palestinian, Christ at the checkpoint. Christ was a Palestinian born and into Roman occupation. I mean, it wasn't even called Palestine when the Romans were here, when Christ was here. It was still called Judea, you know? It was called Israel, Judea, Israel, the Judean here is Samaria you know Galilee it was all it was all Israel even on the other side of the Jordan where he went after John the Baptist was killed it was still part of Israel you know and now it's all Palestine he was a Palestinian his mother was a Palestinian the Romans were an occupying power but still interestingly enough the Jews still killed him 
okay. The Jews still killed him. Somehow the Jews still had the power over the Roman Empire to kill Jesus, even though it wasn't it wasn't Israel, it wasn't Judea. You know? So yeah, I just I'm just so I did my research, I started reading, and then I saw that wow, this is actually pretty this is actually a hot topic. This is a hot button topic, you know. And I also watched I used to watch um Chris Mitchell. He has a show called Jerusalem Dateline on TBN Christian channel Christian broadcaster so Chris Mitchell was very influential and I actually met him as part of this project for peacing and I told him I was like hey Chris you know you helped me in my wow. my development of Christian understanding of you know the Hebraic roots of, of Christianity very nice man um, and you know I, I would watch his show and it was all about what's happening in Israel from a political perspective you know um, Donald Trump the Abraham Accords that was amazing you know and so so i just thought this is pretty wild you know how how little information we have and then during last year's attack from gaza um the operation guardians of the walls um because now by then i had developed a little bit more understanding you know and i'm always that kind of person if i know the truth i have to speak out you know before, I, th I thought the truth was that Israel was an apartheid state. That's what I honestly was taught. I believed it. And I thought, oh, well, you know, it must be true. Everyone is saying it. If an academic can say it, it must be true, right? And that's, unfortunately, most people in the world, if an academic says it, it must be true. If Amnesty International says it, and Human Rights Watch says it, and the UN says it, oh, well, it's obviously gospel truth, right? Because you, you cannot conceive that such powerful organizations who are responsible for the lives of millions of people could actually lie. It, it just, we, it, it, it goes against our intuition as humans. I think humans, we're herd animals. We follow the leader of the pack. So people in powers, people positions of authority that high, why would they lie to you? You expect them to tell you the truth for your own good, but they're lying. They're lying about Israel. It's crazy. So anyway, I started speaking out, you know, I would phone radio here and there, respond to news articles on the internet. By them. yourself? You did this all? Yeah, yeah. So I had met the Jewish Board of Deputies by now, and Sharice Zephyr, she gave me a copy of uh, Benjamin Pogren's Drawing Fire about the examination of the claim that Israel is an apartheid state. So I read that, and I was just, I was like watching YouTube videos, um, like academic stuff, you know, on YouTube. Did and you know that Benjamin Pogren, that he had a very close connection with Madiba with Mandela? Yeah, and, and Robert Subukwe as well. Yeah, and he, yeah. he, wrote, uh, he wrote the book on Robert yeah, and yeah. But he was also the deputy editor of the Red Daily Mail. Yes, yes, yeah. And he lives in Israel and he wrote that amazing book on yeah. debunking the, the theory that Israel's a part of yeah. state. And I mean, he does honestly say that, well, okay, maybe you could say that the occupation in the disputed territories is something which is problematic but I mean we we drove through area C okay and we saw entrances to area A where it's just purely Palestinian authority control Palestinian civil and secu and uh, military authority or security authority control there's big red signs that say no Israeli or n and no Jew is allowed into this territory why if if if, if Israel is an apartheid state why aren't they allowed to go into Palestinian territory if it's Israel isn't that like actually what apartheid the definition is you can't come here because this is ours and your ethnicity says you can't you're an Israeli you're a Jew you can't come into the Palestinian territory what's up with that why don't they let so so what would a two-state solution actually look like would 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 the Palestinian territories become Judenrein Jew free zone is that what it means why 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 can't Jews just live wherever they want to live? Why? I would probably be, be more free to go and live in Area A as a black South African Christian woman than a Jewish person whose ancestral land that actually is. Why? You know, so these are the questions that, you know, society needs to start grappling with because it's just, it's, even if you're not a religious person, Israel anti-Semitism, for me, it's a social justice issue. I don't know how we can call ourselves democratic and civilized when we're allowing one group of people to be attacked randomly, systematically, wantonly, 
um, in a strategic way, whatever, all the different ways that people can be ostracized, victimized, attacked, vilified, the Jews are getting it all the time. Israel is getting it all the time. Like, And there's no thought that goes into it. It's just it's almost like a reflex, you know? So anyway, so yeah, I mean, after, so like I said, I met, you know, Jewish boy debuts and everything. So, and, and I would, I was in communication with Sharice. So I was like, hey, Sharice, you know, I'm going to phone into the radio station and just say this st- stuff, you know? And so she's like, oh, okay, cool, I'll listen in. So I was like, yeah, you know, this land actually belongs to the Jewish people, it's their ancestral land. They're not a colonizing state. If they were colonizers, they wouldn't have given back the Sinai Peninsula after 70, in the 78 um, peace plan. How, how do you call that colonization? Why did they Why did they allow the the Jordanian walk to to have authority over the Temple Mount? Is that colonization? Well, it's a Gaza. They yeah, they from drew Gaza. out of, exactly. I, I said that they withdrew from Gaza, and what did they get in return? Missiles. Missiles that were made out of pipelines for water that should be helping the people of Gaza to have better lives. But jihad and anti-Semitism is more of a motivation for Hamas than their people's well-being. No one talks about that. No one talks about. No one talks about the fact that Israel only fights defensive wars, and then they'll say, "Oh, but what about '67 when they attacked?" I'm like, "Yeah, if you know someone is coming to attack you, it's defensive to preemptively stop them." It was, and it was an amazing move. I mean, that was like brilliant military strategy, you know, when they down the Egyptian Air Force and rightly so I mean what, what are you gonna do you're gonna wait for your enemies to attack you and overwhelm you you know so yeah so um, I did I, I just I was very passionate about it because it was the truth it's a social justice issue anti-semitism is the worst form of racism because it's endorsed by powerful entities in this world if someone had to say the stuff if someone had to say black people control the world black people are money hungry they harvest the organs of white children they they are out to conquer the world they own the media they own the united nations black people are the devil's servants <laughs> i mean if 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 someone had to say the stuff that people say routinely about the jews about blacks they would be completely shut down they would oh you're not a real black Someone says to me, you're not a real black, <clears throat> like they say Ashkenazi Jews are not real Jews. I mean, I, I could take them to court, you know. I mean, I, I, I tweeted the other day, I was like, if Hamas had to say what they say about Israel and the Jews, about black people, they would be at the Hague right now, facing a tribunal. It's true. But somehow it's okay to insult the Jews, to say Israel is an apartheid state. I mean, apartheid is such a heavy label to put on someone. I mean, it's akin to Nazism apartheid you know it's you it's, lived through it you, yeah it's, exactly it's it's right up there with nazism my aunt had to go to england to get a, a, a master's and a phd she couldn't do it in south africa because she was black you know my father a brilliant man was ostracized and was persecuted because he was black imagine if he imagine if there was no apartheid in south africa how amazing that country would have been with everyone working together amazing you know and so i'm just yeah, so I I just thought to myself, look, this is a serious issue and the truth matters, you know, the truth matters and I don't want my children growing up in a world where it's okay to say Israel is an apartheid state when it's not. If Israel was an apartheid state, I would be the first person to say, yes, it's an apartheid state. If I was, I'm here right now, if I'd seen apartheid, I would have said, well, there's some apartheid, look, those poor Palestinian women have to go into a different bus. They don't. They're in the same shopping malls, in the same buses, in the same trains as everyone else, in the same hospitals. So it, it's not happening, and yet somehow I'm just I'm I'm amazed that this narrative is going on, and academics are pushing it. Academics, it's it's incredible, you know, because academics they influence everyone. They influence government policy. They influence school kids because the teachers that are teaching the kids come from universities, you know. So the academy has a serious responsibility to take, and I would love to to challenge. Um, these perceptions you know so that's why I wanted to do this thing of looking at why why the downgrade resolution why is the ANC determined to downgrade its relations with Israel what who benefits from this and did you did you complete it I never ended up actually doing it because um, 
there was just a lot of stuff happening in my life I'm trying to give my kids and you know then COVID hit and that just put a spanner in everyone's works you know um, but also my father also did suggest to me that I should try and take a more another avenue to looking at the issue because he said he was afraid I might be involving myself in politics you know you saw what happened to Chief Justice Mokweng Mokweng right he said pray for, for the welfare of of Israel. Of Israel, and he was made to apologize. Yeah, and they told him he had involved himself in a political controversy. You see, so also, like, it would involve me having to, you know, maybe get interviews from politicians, and I think he was just worried that I might just find myself getting involved in a political discussion instead of a historical discussion, which I think is valid. I think it's valid. So, but I'm still very interested in doing a master's. I'm thinking about different things might be a bit controversial I don't know but I, I I'm very interested to look at I've heard two Israeli politicians say this that Jordan has a role to play in the two-state solution so I think that's a very interesting thing because Jordan when Jordan was created the mandate the British mandate was still law in 1944 when Jordan was created, the British mandate was still law. And that territory was given to Jordan, I think, in 26. And the government of Jordan was inaugurated in 1944. So none, none, the British mandate still stood, which incorporates the territory of Israel and Jordan. People say is uh, the, the British Palestine, and they only show a map of Israel. That's not accurate. It includes Jordan. You know. And then also, someone also pointed out that in 1948, when the Arab countries attacked Israel and the Palestinians rejected the partition plan, international law actually says you have to go back to San Remo. San Remo had given all this land to Israel, you know, and Jordan was still also, Transjordan was still part of the mandate, you know. So there's so much stuff which is like very deep and heavy, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I just. I don't know, am I being naive because there are some people who really hate Israel, who really like, would kill for the for the life of Israel to be perpetuated? I don't know. But I just think it's, a, it's an important discussion to have. Jordan has a role to play. That territory is part of this territory that is under dispute, you know? Um, and I think it would be the responsible thing to do for Jordan and for the Arab world. First of all, to deal with the refugee crisis. How, 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 who, who in their right mind and in their right conscience thinks it's okay for Palestinian children to be born into refugee camps, to be born as refugees, to have a refugee status at birth? What is that? Forty, like 74 years later? Doesn't make sense to me. I think it's just wrong. Um, so I think Arab nations, they should integrate the Palestinian people. UNRWA should be disbanded. I think UNRWA is another cynical attack on the Jewish people again the only people the only refugees in the world who have their own refugee agency which keeps them refugees for decades after the fact are the Palestinians why why it's, it's interesting yeah. <clears throat> you know? so I just think it's there's so many layers to this issue and I don't think one will ever understand completely what what it is because you know if you talk to some people they'll tell you that actually this is a spiritual issue there's, there's a spiritual war against the Jewish people because the God of the universe selected them to be the vehicle through which he brought his law back to earth. And they are, they are entities who hate God and they have a war with him since before time and um, before the earth was created and they, they are out to destroy anything which reminds humanity of God. And so because Israel does that, Israel's a witness and especially after 48 who knew I mean Israel is a miracle why because um, Rabbi Rabbi Pes Pesach Waliki he said Israel is a miracle because a miracle is when the laws of nature are suspended to fulfill the purposes of God so he said also the laws of history are very similar to the laws of nature so one of the laws of history is that if a people are exiled scattered, their territory renamed, their monuments destroyed, and their language destroyed. 
they cease to become a people. You know, they just they stop. They, they no longer exist. They just disappear into time or whatever. So, um, if you look at Egypt, the people in Egypt today, they're not the same people who enslaved the Jews. <laughs> but the Jewish people today are the same people who came out of Egypt. Okay. The Greeks, they're not the same people who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. As much as maybe they still have it as part of their culture or whatever, but their religion is not the same religion as, as it was back then. No one is in the temple of Apollo and Delphi. There's no oracle there anymore, you know. Um, just the Zulu people, I'm Zulu, you know. After 1879, when King Gajwayo was defeated by the British, after that amazing victory at Isandlwana, he was finally defeated by the British, our entire culture changed. You know, um, for example, there was a a plague of cattle disease that went through the Zulu kingdom and killed thousands, millions of cattle, you know, and it changed the culture completely because cattle were, you know, a symbol of wealth. And also when you got married, you would give cattle as lobola, like a dowry. Um, not only did that happen, but the British also put, imposed a, a law on the Zulu to say, a maximum of 10 cattle can be given as lobola. So before you would give whatever you gave, it wasn't necessarily cattle even at some point, at some point, like over history, like you would give whatever you could give. Not everyone had cattle. So now suddenly what happens is because the British imposed this thing of the maximum 10 cattle, people start demanding the maximum. And then it became a money thing, you know. So our culture has changed. And then also with Ubuntu, so there's the maxim of umuntu ungu umuntu ngabantu, a person is a person by other people. Alongside that comes inkosi i inkosi ngabantu, means the, a king or a chief is such because of the people. So you actually had to be endorsed and you had to, you were, you were able to be held accountable. And so one of the ways that you would be held accountable was if you were incompetent or a despot, people would just pack up and leave and go find another king or chief to, to take care of them. And the the culture of africa at that time was that every person has been given by the creator the rights to live on the land so wherever you go you have a right to land so what would happen is that you would pack up with your family and you would go to the other chief or king and you would actually take your rights to land with you so you'd actually decrease the territory of the chief you are leaving and increase the territory of the chief you are going to because your land right went with you everywhere you went so that was an amazing way to hold people, hold chiefs to account. That no longer exists. How do we hold people to account today? You know? Um, so, uh, so why, okay, let me, let me get to how I came to Israel, because it has to do with Ubuntu. So I was asked to give a talk to the Women's International Zionist Federa uh, Organization, Women, International Women's Zionist, WITSO at their fundraiser this year, at the end of March. So I spoke on the issue of Tikkun Olam and what it can teach Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is very much about interhuman uh, relationships, whereas Tikkun Olam, it means to fix the world, but it's, it's interhuman inter relations, but it's based on the Bible. It's based on the word of God. And so I just thought that was really great because because it's, it's based on a set um, canon of scripture which is the unfailing infallible unmutable word of God you can base a philosophy on it right because it's written down it's codified um, if you fail to live up to its standards then you can be disqualified for saying that you operate under Tikkun Olam but with Ubuntu because it's not first of all it's not codified because it you know we're coming from an oral tradition fine but also because it was it, it was working in family systems which are like the building block of the traditional Bantu government system it was the family then the clan then the chieftaincy then the kingdom so within those relations everyone in the family and the clan knew what we all meant about things you know politeness love honesty industriousness everyone knew what you meant today if I say I'm an honest person Someone else has a completely different understanding of what that means, you know, like the details of it. So in, within those family and clan groups, 
on a detailed level people knew on a nuanced level what they meant by those things and so you could you could say whether someone had ubuntu or not because of how they were behaving because of what they all understood ubuntu to mean now we have a situation that on a national level in south africa you have government people in government saying oh we operate on the basis of ubuntu but because it's not codified you can't actually hold the person accountable as to whether or not they actually are operating on the basis of Ubuntu, you know. And so you have a lot of institutions that have been built in South Africa um, or organizations that have been built based on Ubuntu. And there's a lot of government work that is done on the basis of Ubuntu. But because it's not codified, you can't hold them accountable. For example, if, the, um, if a government department says that Ubuntu is their motto, but then they make people wait five hours to get a document. Is that Ubuntu? Is that, mm. is it, you know, if you have to pay a bribe mm. to get something done, is that Ubuntu? It's not. But maybe for them it is. Who knows? But it's not codified, so you can't actually use it as a, you cannot claim it as an ethos because it's not codified, so people can't be held accountable. So in the spirit of my aunt, my aunt Harriet, she would have been someone who said, okay, well, you've seen a problem, how are you going to solve it? So I think it can be solved. And I think it can be solved through the Bible. I mean, 80% of people in South Africa say they are Christians, so this shouldn't be a problem. You know, and in sub-Saharan Africa, yeah, a good uh, between 70 and 80% of people are Christians. So let's have a thing, let's, let's codify Ubuntu using the Bible in its right context as a Hebraic text. You know, let's work with pastors and rabbis and understand what Ubuntu is and it's codified based on the scripture so that then it can actually be something that people can use to govern with and that people they can be held accountable to its principles. Because it's a very good philosophy. It really is. I mean it's it's all about respect and taking care of the elderly and teaching children the right way. It's all about rites of passage as well. You know, it's taking care of the environment, respecting the creation. You know, it's great. But it's, it's, it's obviously very destructive because if it's not used properly, because it allows you to completely manipulate people because it's, it's in people's hearts. They love it. And because of colonization, anything that tells us about our past it's precious to us you know but now it unfortunately if you don't use it properly it can be used to take advantage of people you know so if it can be codified i think that'd be really great i think it'd be very helpful um it would be very helpful on many levels you know it'd be helpful for people in government to know that they're being held accountable and for people to be able to hold them accountable and it would be very helpful for christians to really get serious about the text that they claim as their, as their guiding principle as Christians because there's a lot of Christians out there who don't even read the Bible and they claim to be Christians and that's just scary, you know. What's interesting is that in a, I went to the shul today. In the shul, the synagogue, yeah. the synagogue all that happens is reading. That's all that's, it's just, it's text after text after text is being read. And reading was, from, the, from the Torah. Yeah, from the Torah and from the Tanakh and from the Psalms and Proverbs and I'm just I was I was really blown away because normally in a Catholic church you'll get maximum like 15 Bible verses you know if you really got someone who's really serious about this you're getting like 50 because they've got they're taking like a succession of verses that, as a textual piece you know that's when you're like and that's when you consider like whoa this is serious here we read like half the book of numbers I think you know and then we read a whole Psalm Sometimes you, in, in a Christian church, you're not going to get a whole psalm all the time. You'll sometimes just get a few verses of a psalm, you know. And, you know, we read so much and I was, I was like, wow, okay, this is what it means, a people of the book, you know. Rabbi Sachs has talked about Jews being people of the book and, and, I, and I had seen, you know, this, but today I experienced it for real. Like there was so much reading of the text and praying, praying to God, using the scripture to pray to God. Not just like I'm feeling like this is what I should say, but praying to God in God's own words, in the words of his prophets. I just thought that was amazing. So, I This was your first visit to a synagogue? Yeah, first visit. And in Israel, in Jerusalem, you know, how awesome was that? <laughs> yeah, so I think there's so much we can learn from, from the Jewish 
uh, scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures from the Jewish culture, you know, being here in Israel. I mean, I, I, like I said, I've done a lot of research, you know, but when you see it in practice, you know, you see like, I said to the, the man who took us from the airport, I said, you know, it's like, it's like when you see a small house and then when you go inside, it's really spacious. That's how I felt about Israel, because like on the map, it's tiny, yeah. you know, it's like everyone tells you the size of the Kruger National Park. It's the, ty- the size of Lake, Lake Winnipeg, you know? So you're just expecting to see this tiny, cramped country, and yet there's actually so much space somehow. So much space, there's so much going on. And then if you go into like the Judean hillside, there's so much space. So it's very interesting. And it's so efficient. These, these things are working, you know? And I hear that there's like 3% unemployment. We've got like 40% unemployment and we've got so much space. We've got so much land. We've got three maritime borders. You know, I just, I think, I think if we had the same work ethic as Israel in South Africa, that country would be like, it could be a superpower in the world. Because geopolitically, it is so strategic. The Cape of Good Hope, the British um, were willing to make a lot of concessions after the Napoleonic Wars. But one concession they were not willing to make was the Cape of Good Hope, you know. And then we've got Port Natal, Durban. Since, like, uh, Vasco da Gama days, that was a strategic port, you know. Um, we're protected from the Indian Ocean tsunamis and hurricanes by Madagascar. We've got the amazing fishing waters of the Atlantic, you know. We've got amazing territory. We've got the Drakensberg. So our defensive capabilities based on the Drakensberg could be huge. Just things like, you know... And all the mineral resources. All the mineral resources, the beautiful climates, the tourism potential. Israel turned the Negev into farmland, the desert. We've got the Karoo Desert. And we've got water underground. You know, Israel has a technology to take that out and make it into... They've got drip irrigation, so you save the water, use the water to grow your food. I mean, Israel's growing mangoes. We have in Limpopo, every, every mango season, which is like uh, December to January, the entire Limpopo countryside is orange. Mangoes are just growing. There's no one who's cultivating anything. This is natural phenomena. We have mangoes. But they just, they're, they fall off the tree and they rot. The best thing you're getting is like another tree comes out. Okay, fantastic. But that industry could be making so much money. So there's so much potential in South Africa for people to make money in all sorts of ways and we have a young population very smart people very resourceful people who've survived all sorts of things you know and i just think to myself why why win israel you know it would be one thing if israel was like oh we don't want to help you you're on your own get over yourselves you know but israel has tikkun olam it's a real thing you know rabbi Sachs talked about it quite extensively you know he would say you know jewish people they practice tikkun olam because they're Jews. That's the culture. You, where there's a need, you go and you help on your own as an individual. It's not like you go and you say, hey, minister, whoever, I need money for this. No, out of their own pocket. Or if they don't have that money enough, they mobilize the rest of the community. You know, if we in South Africa had to open our arms to Israel and say, come help us, there'd be a revolution in that country. I mean, Rwanda, Rwanda is getting solar power from an Israeli company. So is Burundi now. You know, Israel, I think, is also helping in the DRC. Um, I mean, it's just amazing. Israel built the Singaporean army in the 60s, I think. Yeah, the 60s. They, they, they built the Singapore army from scratch, Israel, you know. So I just think it's, it's such a shame what's going on in South Africa towards Israel. It is such a shame. It's actually a crime against the South African citizens because it's not like the EU. The EU... If you look at Mo- Mozambique, for example, same thing in Mozambique. The government of Mozambique is anti-Israel, you know, unfortunately. But I think they're softening up a bit um, because, for example, they did allow the Israeli um, military to sell drone detection technology in the north, which has helped actually to... Because the, the, the Al-Shabaab terrorists, they were using drones to spy on military positions of the Mozambican government. And, but imagine what they could do more if they were allowed in there. I mean, Israel is dealing with the most delicate situation here, where you even have Arab-Israeli citizens being involved in some of the terrorism. It's a very delicate surgical operation they have to do to root out these terrorists. For them dealing with Al-Shabaab, 
in northern Mozambique is a piece of cake. I mean, they can do it in their sleep. It's it's not a big deal. So there's so much they could be doing. Even in Mozambique, with the land, they they is the Jews. They came here to Israel. They drained the swamps. They ended malaria. There's a lot of swamp land in Mozambique, which could be turned into amazing arable agricultural land. You know. Um, so I think you know just. I don't understand. I don't understand why ideology, anti-Semitic ideology, on top of that, would be something which our governments in Africa would be adopting when they could be saying to Israel, "Come help us." You know, you've got carte blanche, help us, and you know, we we would be having a revolution now, economic revolution. You know, education, medicine. You know, so anyway, I I I want to do these things um, and this is how I got this job so I'm, I'm working for the South African uh, South African Friends of Israel organization I started working for them in December last year 2021 um, and they put one as a general manager just to help the organization to develop a very strategic and structured approach to our work so we've done a lot of work with churches but we want this work to translate into like a tangible long-term plan to actually turn South African society away from this extremely biased and unbalanced perspective on Israel to a more balanced uh, perspective of Israel and one where actually we see what Israel can do to help our communities you know so our view is that so one of the obstacles we have in South Africa is the Israel as an apartheid state narrative. And the reason why there's such an obstacle in South Africa is because we actually had real apartheid 28 years ago. That's, you know? was, that, that we, that's the foundation. That's yeah, exactly. So we had real apartheid. So when someone says such and such is, is practicing apartheid, it, we know exactly what it means and it hits us to our core. You know? So when someone says Israel is an apartheid state, we don't have any way of knowing so we just take it, especially even like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, Israel's an apartheid state. So Africans will be like, oh, the horror, the horror of apartheid is being perpetuated on some helpless people in the Middle East. How dare they? That's all we think. I mean, and naturally. So we're, we're saying that, okay, we know Israel's not an apartheid state. Um, <clears throat> so in order to counter this narrative, we have to bring to people a narrative which is just as impactful on their soul which is just as, um, what's the word, which, which um, appeals to their values, to their deepest held values, as much as the apartheid narrative. And so we think that with the Tikkun Olam Ubuntu um, <coughs> understanding and bringing Tikkun Olam to communities through education, so the idea would be that Israeli and Jewish organizations would teach communities how to build their own institutions for community-led sustainable development. And then through those organizations, they can partner with Israeli and Jewish organizations to create programs for sustainable development in their communities, all the way from becoming financially self-sufficient to being able to deliver services to their communities that the municipality can't. You know, because a lot of municipalities, unfortunately, they, they lack the capacity to deliver services. But the Constitution of South Africa actually allows community-based organizations to take on the role of municipalities and service delivery if the municipality is unable to do so. So imagine if communities could be taught by Israel, uh, by Israeli and Jewish organizations, how to build institutions. Israel built its first state institutions in 1897. So that means that when the state of Israel was reborn in 1948, they had, they had a state. They had all the state institutions ready and able to go. And they hit the ground running. And 74 years later, Israel is literally a, an economic powerhouse. It's, it's, a, it's a world power, you know, this tiny nation of Holocaust survivors. <laughs> you know, obviously there were Jewish people who had come here, but you know, a lot of people came from the Holocaust. And there's, there's a video of a ship, I think it's called the Exodus, yeah. where you have the Holocaust survivors dressed in their prison uniforms singing Hatikva with the Israel flag. I mean, that's where Israel comes from. And then now today you've got 
Nobel Prize winners in medicine, economics, literature, everything. You know, it's it's an incredible story. And I don't know anyone who in Africa who would hear the story and not be inspired, especially when when you know Israel and the Jewish people are saying, Hey, we can teach you. We can help you. We can help and you. And we too. want to help you. And you want to help. Like you want to passionately, desperately want to help us. You know, it's not like the EU. The EU in, in Cabo Delgado in, in Mozambique, they just gave money. Israel actually gave intelligence tech to the Mozambicans, you know, and it's the same thing in Africa. The EU is like, here's some cash, deal with it. Israel is like, we can come and show you how to make your lives better with your own hands, you know. So I think that would be amazing, and I think that would counter the apartheid narrative. I would hope also that it would really like, impact people politically, because I think Israel deserves a better rap. Even though I know many organizations, they just do it because it's tikkun olam. You do it because God says so, and that's that's the reward. It's because you, you did something good that, that pleases God. I think that's amazing. But I would love it if, you know, there could be solid political dividends for Israel. Because I think, I think Israel deserves it. Israel deserves to be given that respect as a leader in the world. You know, and from a biblical perspective, as a Christian, it's a miraculous country. It's a country which, if you understand it and if you honor it, you'll actually be giving yourself the opportunity to learn more about God, the true God of the universe, you know. And for me, that, I think, is what's always been my motivating, a motivating force in my life. I've always wanted to understand God. So I went all over the place trying to understand God, you know. And I think having read the Bible and having come here and seeing today in the synagogue how much the Bible is spoken. I mean, it wasn't, no one came and said, you know, my personal experience is this. It was none of that. It was, this is God, the house of God. We're learning about God. It's all about God. We're praying to God. And then Shabbat, praying to God all day long, you know, contemplating God. And, you know, in the morning, everyone wakes up, Jewish people all over the world, they wake up and they say the prayer, the sh uh, here, O Israel, the Lord Shabbat is prayer. God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and your strength. I mean, yourself, that's, yeah. that's a daily thing. And I just think that's incredible. And I think, you know, we God has proven himself through Israel. I mean, like I said, it, Israel defies the laws of history. No other nation on earth. I mean, the Dalai Lama spoke to a, 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 a rabbi and said, how did you guys do it? For 2,000 years, you've been scattered all over the world. How did you remain a cohesive people? He's like, we, we've been out of Tibet for a few decades and we're totally falling apart. We don't know what to do with ourselves. We don't even know where to start. We into like keeping ourselves together. And yet the Jewish people, I mean, where, where is it? I think in Japan, there's 7,500 Jews. In India, there were Jews, like I was saying, who were, who've been there since the Babylonian exile. They've kept their Jewish culture intact. It's the same, they do the same rituals and ceremonies yeah. that Jews in Portugal are doing and in Israel are doing. And it's just like, so I think God has shown that this is, it's supernatural. It, it's, it's not normal. There's no more Babylonians. There's no more Chaldeans or Hittites or even like the Mali Empire. It's not, it's not what it was, you know, Ethiopia, Egypt, I said it's different. Ethiopia is, maybe has kept some hallmarks, but it's a totally different landmass than it was during the times of the Queen of Sheba, you know. And yet King Solomon's words, the Psalms, I, I mean the Proverbs, King Solomon's words, King David's words are still alive today. The city of David is right here. The walls that Solomon built are still standing in Israel with the same language that he used in the temple being used in the synagogue. It's amazing. And it's it's back, you know, it's back. Like the prophet said, like Zechariah said, you'll see old men and old women in Jerusalem with their grandchildren. And that's exactly what's happening. Jews who speak Hebrew and read the Torah. So, yeah, amazing. <laughs> so I just want to thank you. <clears throat> Pamela, this has been incredible. Thank you. So, um, so I'll just really come into the video. But I am extremely grateful. It's been such an honor and a privilege, really. Thank you so much. And I just want to mention uh, what you said. It's so true. I had the privilege of actually meeting a survivor from the Exodus oh, in really? Farm Masarek in the north. 
wow. she was on the ship on the Exodus. Mm. And what you said is really quite true that after 45, after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, where a third of the Jewish people were destroyed, three years later, just three years later, in 1948, we get the re-establishment of the State of Israel. Yeah. It's miraculous. It's miraculous. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Mm. But just, and this I think is also incredible, just as your father was the South African ambassador to Japan, you are like a goodwill ambassador from South Africa and from the Christian world to the Jewish people. Awesome. So you are so inspiring and so passionate and um, we just wish you all the muzzle and brochets, all the only Hashem's blessings, God's blessings, you. that you should be successful in what you do. Yeah. And we are so grateful. You are such an example. We can all strive to emulate, really. Thank you. And it's been such an honor and a privilege for my wife and I to have you here for Shabbat. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we are so grateful to you. And Pamela, just keep on the amazing work that you do because you really are an inspiration for all of us. Thank you so much, Les, and thank you for inviting me. It was amazing. Such a lovely experience. And I'm so glad to be in Israel. This is my first time. Can you imagine? And such an amazing... Well, please God, this will be your first of many visits. Yes, I hope so and, too. And uh, you managed to actually meet survivors in the today yeah. as well. Yeah. And you met a paratrooper who liberated yeah. um, amazing. the old city as well. And who we went to pray at the Western Wall yeah. for the first time in like 2,000 years for the Jews. So it's been in the language of the Torah. Oh my gosh, what a mind, what a mind-blowing experience. <laughs> Pamela, thank you so much. Thank you so much.